It's great to see such a great turnout. Uh, I'll be the third person to thank you for braving the, uh, the snow and thanking the government for delaying so that we could have everybody here uh, for, for, for this morning's session. Um, again, I'm Mark Peters from uh, Idaho National Laboratory, and I'm very honored to be up here with an incredibly distinguished panel, a very large panel, uh, which will be a great conversation. Um, I, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Senator Murkowski for being here with us this, this morning and providing those great remarks and for her leadership. Uh, in the broader energy space, and particularly in, in nuclear energy. Um, you heard from her deep commitment, and, and, and she's going up there today to do a very important thing for the nation to try to push through, and it, push through an energy bill, and we really appreciate her leadership. Um, the first panel poses an, an interesting question. I think all three panels pose interesting questions, and we're, we're going to, but the first one is, let's get real. When can we expect commercial advanced reactors, which is an interesting question. Um, what I thought, I, I'm the moderator, I'm not going to talk a whole lot. I'll remind the panel, we're going to try to actually have a conversation here uh, without facing each other, facing the audience. Uh, so, but I'd, I'd ask you to, you know, you know, we have a lot to, y'all have a lot to say, try to be as succinct as possible. And, and I, I'm hopeful that everybody will have an opportunity to say what they want. I, I do want to, um, I, I want to structure it a little bit, but uh, again, we want to have a conversation. So if it goes in a direction that sounds interesting, I'll probably let it go. Um, but first and foremost, I, I'll, I'll make the premise that the value proposition for nuclear energy is strong and it's growing stronger. And so I'd, I, I plan to start there. But I'd also like to talk about, so why nuclear, why advanced nuclear? But also part of this needs to be the context of the existing fleet and the importance of the existing fleet. We'll start there. Uh, so let's say, the value proposition will be the first place. And then, and then get a little bit into, we have folks up here who are thinking a lot about advanced technologies and developing themselves uh, with their companies. And so I want to talk about what's, what's out there and what's attainable. Uh, and then you can't have this conversation, and actually I'll probably pull you into the, this part of the conversation in particular, is the global, the global picture. Other countries are doing this. What about, the, you know, where's the US sit? Uh, and then uh, finally, um, I think there's an opportunity, and sitting from the lab's perspective, I think it is an opportunity for a new paradigm in terms of innovation. So I'll bring the undersecretary into that conversation. The department's doing a lot of thinking there. Uh, others, others, others. Rachel, I'll bring you into that part of the conversation. But I encourage everybody to engage throughout, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. So with that, um, I think I'll start with, uh, with Carol Browner. So I'm getting my order. Hi, Carol. You're way down there at the end. Uh, I th if you would, please start with uh, you know, this notion of the value proposition, the value of nuclear go forward with the urgency of climate change as well as mm -hmm. uh, energy security. So comment on that, please. So first of all, let me uh, thank everybody for, for joining us here and the opportunity uh, to be here. And um, I think I can, um, I am proof positive uh, that what Senator Murkowski said about uh, nuclear being a bipartisan uh, issue. I think I'm one of the, uh, the Democrats here today. Um, uh, just uh, by, by quick way of background, um, I was not always pro-nuclear. I, I think we had a very common view uh, among environmentalists that it was troubling, that there were issues, et cetera, et cetera. Over, I don't know, 12 years ago now, um, I had an epiphany. Um, I uh, was thinking about climate change. I was thinking about carbon emissions, and I realized uh, that I couldn't be responsible in my views about climate change and carbon pollution and take off the table a uh, carbon-free source of energy. So I changed uh, my uh, position and uh, remain very committed today uh, to uh, the issues surrounding the existing nuclear fleet, the need to maintain that uh, fleet, and the Senator spoke very eloquently uh, to that. And then obviously the purpose of today's conversation, which is to look at where do we uh, go from here. Um, I would say that for me, uh, to, to Mark's point, um, the issue of climate change, the issue of carbon pollution is paramount. And I think that uh, we have a tremendous opportunity both here in the United States as we look at the mechanisms for maintaining um, our existing uh, fleet. Uh, to to and, and I, I the senator and I may have a slight disagreement. Um, the um, uh, clean power plan that the president has put forward, the work that states can now do, I think provides an opportunity 
uh, to ensure that we maintain uh, that base load. It's, it's 19 percent. Uh, uh, nuclear, existing nuclear is 19 percent. But we also have to be mindful, and, and, and uh, Ross mentioned this uh, when we were in the, in the green room earlier, uh, the rest of the world wants uh, power, and we will want probably more power, even if we're as efficient as we possibly can be here in the United States. And to do that in a way that does not contribute to uh, carbon pollution, I think, is, is hugely important. But I think um, as we think about the conversation today, it's important to think about the advanced uh, nuclear as building on top of uh, this base load, and it will be important to ensure broad uh, public support. I mean, uh, you know, these things are all complicated. They're all difficult. They're hard for people to understand. Uh, people have busy lives. They're doing a lot of things. And so I think we have to start with what we have, how we maintain that, and then how do we build out here in the United States and ultimately um, around right. the world. Thank, thanks, Carol. Uh, Dan, can I, can I ask you to comment on this as well, please? Well, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And uh, good morning, panelists. Good morning to you all. Um, so I guess I'm another, <clears throat> another Democrat whose position has, has evolved over time. Um, and I've devoted a good chunk of, of, of my career to date on, on renewable energy. I served as Assistant Secretary of Energy for Efficiency and Renewables, co-founded a renewable and investments fund, worked for a wind company, uh, helped Google get into the renewable energy business, and I, and I chair the board of the American Council on renewable energy. But I have to say, I don't think renewables can do it all in the U.S. or globally. I, I strongly believe we need the whole package, all of the above, if you will, and that's efficiency, renewables, natural gas, carbon capture, storage, a smart grid, and importantly, nuclear power in the U.S. and globally, and both the current fleet and the next generation. Uh, Energy Secretary asked me and also Carol to serve on the new Department of Energy Task Force on Nuclear Power. I agreed because I think it's important to get to the bottom very soon of what it would take to really build a significant new fleet of nuclear reactors in the U.S. that can add multiple gigawatts per year between 2030 and 2050. In particular, the task force is going to look at several key questions. What are the most effective business models? What would it take from a business standpoint? Secondly, what are the essential licensing reforms? And third, and critically, how do we reform electricity markets to give greater value to nuclear's base load and zero carbon benefits? particularly in competitive markets in the U.S. The report's going to be on Secretary Moniz's desk by the end of the year for the next administration and for the industry. And, and I, I'm hopeful we will be able to put something very serious, thoughtful together that will form part of the blueprint for the next generation of advanced reactors. Thanks, Dan. That's an important, important effort. The timing's, of course, perfect and, and intentional. Um, Maria, I'm Paint, paint a picture for us about the path. So you have an existing fleet, you have small modular reactors that are closer to market, and then you have advanced reactors. So from your, you're the perfect person, I think, to paint that sort of picture for us about how that will play out. Yeah, thanks, and uh, appreciate being on the panel today. Uh, actually, the picture that you painted is very much how we look at it. It's really a continuum of innovation. Uh, you have the strong operating fleet that you have today. Let's look at last year's numbers, 91.9% capacity factor for the U.S. fleet. That's two decades of very strong performance. So we have a good foundation. Um, we take upon that the innovation. The next stage of innovation, small modular reactors. And if you look at uh, the folks that are working on that, you look at the investment there, that has the potential in the 2020s, early 2020s, to come to fruition. Um, and, and, and real work, uh, real progress uh, being made there. Uh, this is giving us time for the innovation on what we talked about here, the advanced uh, non-light water reactors uh, that could be really um, positioned in the 2030 uh, time frame. So again, really looking at that as a continuum um, conversation from where we are today, that strong, well-operated fleet, a lot of learning, and a lot of that learning operationally can be applied uh, to this innovation and this advanced reactors. Thanks, Maria. S S Steve, uh, keep, keep on that train of thought. Uh, from the utilities perspective, I mean, you're, you're building AP1000s. 
you're thinking about advanced reactors, but start to get at the when part. I'm interested. I have a sense of urgency I think you share. Uh, so. Yeah, I appreciate the, appreciate the opportunity today and the terrific turnout. Um, I can just feel the energy is continuing to build here as, as a lot more folks get involved. The urgency, I do think it, it's a cautionary one for us. And I, I think we talk about innovation and technology. I really think we need to think innovatively. How do we bring this technology to market sooner than we have in the past? And I think we have the tools, the technology, but we have some barriers there. So, you know, as a utility, we want optionality. We're, we, we provide all sources of energy, clean, safe, reliable, affordable. As Dan said, we're doing all of that. <clears throat> we want more options. And we just see the promise of uh, advanced nuclear reactors to, to, to give us more optionality as, as, a, as a utility. Now, 2030, I think, is where we need to really be focusing. As we look at the existing fleet, and many will be extended, but some may not, and we're going to need to have optionality there. And so I would just challenge you know, everyone involved in this that this can't be business as usual as we try to address some of these problems. And, and I think we need to really coalesce, collaborate, and innovate how we bring these technologies to market. I think the promise is there. I think the energy is there, but there's a couple of barriers that we really need to address to move this technology forward. So 2030 should get everybody's attention, I would, I would think. Uh, that means we need to move smartly. Yeah, we, we, move, we need to be back. building early next yeah. decade, demonstrating yeah. through the 2020s, and we need to be right. scaling up here right. to get something on the table by the 2030 right. time frame. Right. Um, okay. Uh, other other. I'm, I'm going to transition a little bit over to talking more about the technology and what's what's out there and what's attainable. Is there other other comments from the panel on this notion of the value proposition? We're on a violent agreement on that, I would say. Okay, that's good to know. So we agreed on the first point. Um, so so what's attainable? Ross, I actually want to start with you as a transition. Uh, so you know you've thought a lot about the energy space. You've been, you, you, you know you think about it from an investor perspective. Uh, you've become very bullish on nuclear. So, so maybe tell us that story. Uh. Uh, <clears throat> sure. So uh, I've spent a lot of uh, both my personal and professional career looking at different forms of energy. Um, I'm not actually married to any particular type. Uh, I like to look at the bigger picture of what does it take to solve the large problems that we face into the future. Um, and I'm a technology optimist. And one of the studies uh, that I helped do for Google looked at what is it that you can achieve using all renewables. Um, I have you know, solar panels of both types on my house, and it's kind of curious to see how that extends into the world. Um, and when you match that with all the conceivable advances you could make in wind and geothermal, um, you can achieve a lot. You can almost get to about 50% reduction in CO2, which sounds great, but in terms of a climate victory or uh, decreasing substantially the use of natural gas, it isn't. Um, and if we really want a diverse and secure energy future, one that scales to the rest of the world, we need to bet on advanced forms of energy. And nuclear is one that I find particularly interesting because there's so much that we can pick up and run with. And in the investment crowd, you'd call this low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think the reason <coughs> a bunch of the companies are here today is because people have looked at developments that have occurred in the past. Uh, they're you know, it's, it's like the physics and the science is reasonably well understood, and it's, it's good engineering that needs to move it forward. Uh, and so if, if we want to see a change in the world, um, you know, we put man on the moon. Uh, it's a question of willpower. Do we have eight people out of ten saying stop and slow down, or do we have nine people out of ten saying how can I help you move faster? Right. I think that's the side we want to be on. Right. Okay, thanks. Ashley, comment on the innovation piece. Uh, so, you know, Steve brought it up and Ross did as well. We need to think about innovation in a different way. You've thought a lot about this. So what, what, give us some your perspective. Yeah, well, I think um, we're, we really see a, a great, you know, vibrant innovation community in the U.S. in nuclear. And um, it's quite distinct from what we saw in the early days of nuclear power. The initial development was really from the central government um, down. And we didn't necessarily think about different ways of meeting market needs and different ways of providing the important attributes that energy can prov provide. And I think that this um, diverse crop of innovators who are working on this problem today are looking at it from a new standpoint and really trying to see how they can provide the um, clean, safe, affordable energy that we've been talking about today and that the senator mentioned. Um, and you know, just looking at different market segments that they can 
um, address. And, and so I think that that's really productive and we're likely to see um, much greater success than we've seen in the past. Okay, thanks. So, so I, I, would, I would remark that uh, the senator mentioned the White House event in early November uh, and there was, there was events that led up to that and discussions like this that we're having today. And, and I, would, I would maintain that the, the people in the room are, it, it's a really, the, the room is evolving in terms of the kind of people that are coming to this conversation. We have folks who've thought about a lot about renewables in the past, uh, and, and, and that's represented on this panel, but also we've got um, not only large nuclear suppliers like General Electric, we also have small, smaller companies com coming, to, coming to the table. Uh, and, and private sector and private capital. And so it's a really interesting time. I, I think, suffice it to say, I think we're headed into a new paradigm here. Uh, the, the question is how do we capitalize on that? And I don't, no pun intended, uh, but how do we capitalize on that? Um, so I would like to transition, uh, Jay, uh, Jay, from a, a large nuclear supplier perspective, General G. Itachi, you know, how are you thinking, of, you know, you're, you're in the BWR business, but how, how are you thinking about advanced nuclear as well? Yeah, so we've been in the business a long time, right. uh, obviously. I think uh, fission was discovered in 1938. And we had our scientists in the GRC immediately <coughs> after that, providing some of the first separated U-235, uh, 238. Um, after the Atomic Energy Act, I, I want to maybe go back to the future yeah, and sure. uh, take that aspect on how we might be able to look forward. Good. So if you think about what happened back then, the Atomic Energy Act in 1954, we formed our nuclear business in 1955. I actually have run across the old papers. It wasn't even a Selectric typewriter at that time. It was real old typewriter. Um, and we formed that, and we signed a contract with ComEd for Dresden 1. And back then, Dresden 1 was an advanced reactor. That thing went critical in 1959. That was just amazing collaboration within the AEC, the government, uh, all the different parties. Why can't we do that again? Sort of my theme is exactly what Maria laid out. You know, we've got a great operating set of reactors. We need to keep them online. And yes, I applaud the DOE for also going out with the FOA on those two uh, awards. I think it's great that we continue to push the envelope on that technology. But right here, right now, we've already got the technology we can bring out. We've got uh, the SMRs that are proven uh, in the LWR space. But in the advanced space, we've got technology like PRISM based on uh, the EBDBR, 30 years of operation. That's ready to go. It's ready to go. That's the next layer. And then we can continue to push the envelope. So what I'd like to do is continue to start working the licensing issue, start building, because we are behind. The Russians are already out there with the uh, BN-800. Chinese have uh, HGTRs. So we need to get moving, because I do believe we're behind. So uh, I think that's what I would say is let's set that moonshot for let's get the next thing by 2030. That should be our moonshot, bringing the whole community together there. Okay, thanks. You brought up licensing. Uh, let, let's pursue that for a minute. Yep. Uh, Steve, I'm gonna ask Stephen Ashley to comment on that. So, so licensing advanced machines, maybe pr your perspective on that. Yeah, I think uh, our perspective from utility, we've, we've gone recently through our licensing process with the APM 1000. So a lot of learnings through that you know, 10 year or so process and we're continuing to go through it. Uh, it it's just my perspective there is just some great ideas about what needs to be done with regards to licensing. And, and I think the regulator is in a position to wants to support it. I, I think our challenge is how do we take 10, 15, even 20 different groups that have ideas about how do we modernize, and we'll call it modernize, I think. It's not a complete rewrite. I think modern, modernization is the right term. But how do we coalesce that into really a, one single strategic plan that will benefit all the technologies. I mean, we just think a kind of a technology neutral framework is where we should go, but I think we have a challenge to bring Ashley's group who has terrific ideas. We have ideas as utilities. Uh, Nick's got there. You know, we all have ideas. It's just we're not going to get there. We're not going to support 2030 at the pace that we're doing it right now. So I would kind of propose it's kind of time for all the groups that really want to participate here to kind of come together and start to really sort out from a priority standpoint, what do we need to do and how do we start to organize ourselves to give one consistent voice, whether we need congressional help, the NRC is going to need some funding to do this work or we do it and have the NRC review it. Um, that's really where I think we need to go and I think we need to do that soon because I think the signals that we would send if we get organized. So you know, I would throw out a challenging assignment for us 
can we coalesce by you know end of second quarter this year have some structure in place have a strategic plan and start marching down the road i, I think that's where we need to go so thanks steve ashley Right, yeah, I think um, Steve, Steve touched on one of the key issues, which is that the regulator, um, the NRC, really needs to have resources that they can um, that they can dedicate to this project and dedicate to looking at advanced reactors and eventually developing that technology neutral framework. Um, so they have a really challenging funding model right now that I think folks on Capitol Hill can work to improve so that NRC is really able to focus some energy on this um, problem. And you know, ultimately, I think we will get to a technology-neutral framework. And NRC has done work on that in the past um, quite successfully. They just haven't had the, um, the reason to really carry that to completion. But the reason is here today. Everybody in the room today is, is the reason to take that all the way to the finish line. Um, I think one other challenge that we have is to make sure that as the NRC moves towards that, um, we don't slow things down for the folks who want to get out there now and um, be the 2030 story. So we're going to need to think carefully, and the regulator will need to think carefully and work with the industry to ensure that there's a transition period where um, we're able to work within the current framework to get these projects built that are out here now. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, Carol. I just want to, as a former regulator, um, I think that it is hugely important that people be mindful of the need of the NRC. And, um, you know, what we don't want to do is end up in a situation where it's, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul. So we're suddenly pulling resources off of the relicensing for the existing facilities to try and do this. So I think uh, the, the points that have been made about giving the, the NRC the tools that they need. I think. Secondly, they need to engage all stakeholders, and obviously industry is an important part of that, but there are other stakeholders that I think if you bring them in earlier, you can avoid some problems uh, down the road. I mean, I think all of us have seen situations where the industry can agree to something, but then we're not able to make progress because there are other uh, parties. And the third piece I would say is when you do bring in all of the stakeholders, you know, you, it may feel like it's, it's backing up a little bit, but to uh, begin with a shared view of where this is, is headed and then what the component uh, parts are. And I think that can make, you know, it's a little bit of time on the front end, but it will have a huge payoff um, on, on the back end. But you know, I, I, I think the, 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 the first order of business, and I don't know if it's the senator's bill or some other mechanism, is making sure that the, the commission has uh, the resources and they're not in a constant bind over do we do this or do we do that, because that will never work out well uh, for anybody, at least in my experience. Yeah, if, if I may take moderator's privilege and build, you know, I, I'll second everything you all said. And I, I would, I, I keep saying, let's take the long view. Let's build, let's not think about shortcuts up front. Let's take the long view here and make this work well. Because if we're, if, I think if we're all right, we're going to be building new nukes for a long time, we hope. And so let's, let's get the licensing framework right up front and take the time to do it. Although there is a sense of urgency, we need to, we need to get moving. If I could uh, yeah, please, Ross. sort of add to this. So people have talked about multiple players going through the process at the same time. One of the really important reasons to do this is to actually make progress in the engineering so that you can figure out who are the cost winners. Because one of the things we all want is cheaper energy. Mm -hmm. And if we restrict the number of players up front, then we're not going to get the best deal in terms right. of having the lower cost energy right. we want. So we need to have as many people move through that process to figure out the economics and make sure that's what's working too. Right. That's a good transition, but Jay, do you want to say something? I think that's right. Okay. It's getting the framework in place, technology neutral for the advanced reactors. And right. Then let, let the, the process take place and the All right. winners will, will come through. Okay. That's actually a perfect transition, John. So adva advanced reactor, so full disclosure, John hired me at Argonne, so uh, <laughs> this is a weird kind of thing for me. Uh, right, right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, <laughs> but uh, talk about advanced reactor concepts. You're one, one of those that's out there. Certainly. Um, well, I spent my career in advanced reactor development at Argonne National Laboratory, and I'm struck by the fact that uh, what we're seeing is a rapidly changing market for nuclear. We've got partnerships with renewables that are important. We're probably going to see a decrease in the smaller coal plants, the number of them around the country. So what does that market tell us about uh, what we need to be a true partner as nuclear power plants? Um, there's also an urgency. These things are happening quickly. And uh, 
uh, you know, the 20, 20 time frame, 2030 time frame is an urgent challenge for us given the difficulties in bringing a new technology to the uh, marketplace as well as the licensing and all of the other constraints. So I look at this more or less in terms of return on investment. If I look at what uh, the nation has already invested in innovation in nuclear, it's been tremendous. And the one technology that we're pursuing because of that is uh, sodium-cooled fast reactors, but in different configurations. Uh, Jay talks about PRISM. Uh, we'll hear about TerraPower. We have our own uh, concept, advanced reactor concepts. I think that um, looking back at the innovation that's already been completed and making the best of that in safety, economics, uh, reliability, is really an exciting prospect right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my message would be that um, uh, in the right regulatory structure, I think much of the advanced reactor technology is ready to go and very innovative forms. And then other newer technologies can follow that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. So, so Simon, uh, that's, a, that's another perfect transition to, to terrestrial energy's uh, work, so please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. And, and firstly, th I'd like to thank uh, Third Wave for uh, inviting us to participate in, in, in the event today. Um, so I'd like to talk briefly about our technology. It's, 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 a, uh, it's a different technology. It uses uh, a molten salt reactor system. And just briefly, a molten salt reactor system is, is, is defined as one where the, the fuel and the coolant are one and the same, a, uh, a liquid, a molten salt. Um, now, with this approach, which is... Uh, which is as different as, it, it's a fundamentally different approach, you uh, address the, the principal challenge, the main challenge of any reactor designer in a very different way. Uh, and that, uh, that challenge is how do you dissipate the intense heat of the fission process? And that is, uh, your, your ability to do that is the central pillar of your safety case. So with a molten salt reactor approach, you have the ability to dissipate heat through a, the natural and passive mechanism of convection. And it's our view that using, using a uh, molten salt react system, you have an advantage when you're making a safety case. And by extension, you, have an, uh, you, you will have a commercial advantage as well. Because it's your, it's your making your safety case which drives many of the costs associated with nuclear design and construction, <coughs> your cost of licensing, cost of, uh, cost of construction, um, and um, uh, and, uh, and uh, probably cost of uh, uh, operations as well. So we're using the, the uh, a molten salt reactor approach. Um, our particular design is called the integral molten salt reactor. So what we've done is we've taken a design that has been, uh, it's lab proven, it's been operated for, uh, for, for, for many years at Oak Ridge National Lab, um, and we've, we've taken that design uh, and uh, um, made s some changes to it, um, uh, uh, which enables you to take a lab reactor and turn it into an industrial reactor. Now, a lab reactor is not an industrial reactor. An industrial reactor is one that is simple and safe to maintain uh, and operate and critically has a high utilization factor, 90% plus these days. Um, so we believe that uh, with the molten salt reactor approach and our integral molten salt reactor design, we have an industrial reactor. Uh, we also have uh, a, a reactor system that has no fundamental technical challenges remaining between where we are today uh, and, and commercialization. We do also recognize, though, that there is a lot of, uh, of detailed engineering work to be done, uh, mostly ordinary engineering work to be done uh, between now and, uh, and the, um, the commissioning of our first power plant. We believe that with our integral molten salt reactor technology, we can put a product, a, a reactor product, uh, into uh, an industrial market, into the market in the 2020s. We're making the statement that we're not part of the 2030 narrative or the 2040 narrative um, for, for, for advanced reactors. We believe we can commission our first power plant um, in, the, in the 2020s. And from a commercial perspective, we believe that this, this, this technology, our power plant will be able to compete at the center of industrial energy markets um, uh, on the uh, on, on the basis of cost and convenience with fossil fuels. Now, when you're designing a reactor system, you must think in a business context, uh, you know, on a one-on-one basis, and that is, is my project, is my product 
competitive uh, with, uh, in, in, in uh, global industrial energy markets. And we believe that our, our design, uh, the integral molten salt reactor, is indeed competitive in major industrial energy markets. And we're looking to put it into that market uh, in the 2020s. Thanks, Simon. That, that, that's, a, that's an important 2020s. That's, 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 that's incredible. Uh, it's, you also made the important point that it isn't just electricity markets. It's a broader, it's a broader market that you're trying to tap. A broader set of markets. It is, yes. I mean, the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the uh, molten salt reactor operates at about 700 degrees C. Uh, that is not a, uh, a feature that's exclusive to molten salt reactors. Other reactors actually operate at, at much higher temperatures as well. But operating at a higher temperature permits you to do something that current light, re re uh, light water reactors can't do. You can directly provide heat to industry. And your role from an environmental perspective is that you can make the claim that's, that, that your technology can drive the, uh, drive the decarbonization of the primary energy system. It's not just about power provision. So you have a much, much potentially, uh, you have a much bigger market, a much bigger market footprint for your, for your product. Thank you. So, so the senator made the many, many important remarks, but she brought up innovation as really central to what, what they're thinking about up on the Hill. And that excites somebody like me, of course, uh, uh, very much. And it, I'm sure it excites you as well, Rachel. So, so uh, comment on that. I mean, you, you know, you're right. You're there. You're, you're innovating yourself. You're also teaching the next generation. So talk about it. Right. I, I think, I mean, as a, as a professor, now is a very exciting time to be in nuclear engineering because, you know, the students in the program haven't been around long enough to know that everything moves slowly in nuclear. They don't know that yet. Nobody told them. Um, so, right. Uh, so I think there's a huge opportunity to plug the universities into really facilitating nuclear innovation in a new way because you have people who, you know, they chose nuclear because they want to help save the world. They're excited. And giving them a way to um, both develop new technologies themselves so that we can have, as Ross was mentioning, many ideas that can help us solve the economics problem um, is one of, the, one of the ways to do it, but also getting them involved in a way that the current knowledge is not lost. Uh, plugging into the GAIN initiative, uh, making sure they understand what's going on with the current fleet, how do we transition. I mean, there's, they're very excited. There are a lot of ideas and, and defining how the universities can get involved um, and facilitate uh, the collaboration between students and industry, I think, is is going to be key to making sure we don't just have the same old habits. Right. Uh, before you stop, one more thing that I'd like you to explore, explore with us is, um, you know, when you talk about the, the, the large number of, uh, of concepts that are starting to come up, a lot of those are coming out of universities. They are. So, so, so maybe comment on that. What's, what's, why, why, what's causing that change and that shift? It's great. I mean, some of it is just there are after sort of the big dip in nuclear, they're just more students and they're trying to figure out what are we going to do next. There are all these ideas that were really neat um, that took on some of, the, some of the things that people would like to improve about nuclear energy. And they were like, well, why don't we just look at those? And I, and I think it's a fresh look at some of these old technologies that, and it's no longer the case that we have to stay with LWRs. There's, there's an opportunity and, and a fresh perspective that are combined in an environment where people are really serious about nuclear because people are finally getting serious about the environment. Um, right. And, and some of the, the uh, job opportunities and some of the global security issues and, and all the other things. So it's kind of, they've grown up with, with just a different perspective about why and how. Right. And, and I think that's part of it. And uh, so things like establishing these uh, national innovation centers, maybe, nuclear incubators and, and using existing mechanisms like the NEUP program to, to really ensure that there is support for that innovation. But as you see more and more of, the, of that kind of innovation and, and ideas coming out of the universities, I imagine the younger generation is like, oh, well, I want to go do that. So it's sort of just it, yeah, it's infectious. Yeah, there's a lot of excitement. And you know, the more you see companies across the range of size and scale, yeah. um, I think really inspires people so that they know there are really innovative projects happening at GE, but they also see Transatomic and U-Power, and in the middle they see you know, new scale, so that there are places across all the stages of development. So for anybody sort of uh, 
interest and personal risk and whatever affiliation, there's like exciting places to go at, at all stages. Great, thanks, that's great, great comment. Yes, Steve. Uh, just to follow on that comment, we're seeing the same thing within the existing fleet of operators. I mean, there isn't a day goes by where I'm not having folks from our organization just wanting to know more, want to get involved, want to say, hey, how can I get involved with that? So we're going to see even more of the existing kind of nuclear community that's operating the existing fleet reaching out even further to the universities and developing even further partnerships and kind of promoting, you know, this future that we potentially can have. So it's, it's just not in the, in the academic, it, it's also among the existing fleet yeah, of operators thanks. that has really picked up here in the last year. That's, that's great, that's great, that's great. So, yeah, so I was going yeah, to go ahead to comment actually on the, uh, if you like, the, uh, the, the demographic character of support these days for, for, for nuclear energy. Um, I think this, it's got a quite a clear character to it. The, the younger generation is much more inclined to support nuclear energy, existing nuclear energy, and also adv advanced nuclear uh, um, than the, the older generation. And this is, I think, pertinent because when, it, when a trend is established with that type of profile to it, that the generations coming through um, have a much, much stronger support for a certain, uh, 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 and advocate for a, a certain technology, a certain policy position, you, you don't really want to get the wrong side of it because it's an ex yeah. inexorable increase in pressure. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I think that's a, an important point. You know, Carol talked about bringing all the stakeholders to the table. John talked about how to be a true partner. And Rachel just mentioned not having the same old habits. And another part of innovation, I think, is trying to get ahead of the concerns that folks, in a sense, on the other side are going to raise. Mm -hmm. trying to be innovative in that process, you know, safety, waste, proliferation. I think we've got to think about, we've got to anticipate that a lot of that is going to be raised and take a smarter approach to addressing those sorts of things in the U.S. That's in the regulatory context, that's in the investment context, that's when it comes to government spending. There's going to be a big debate, and I do think we do have a new generation of, of folks who are interested. We have a new generation of technologies. I think we have to take a, a more innovative approach to, to dealing with what are going to be the inevitable concerns that folks raise. That's a yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Carol. You know, I mean, I, I, I think that it is um, very encouraging to hear what Rachel and, and, and what Simon have to say about the, the new generation. Um, when I talk to younger people, if they watched The Simpsons or played Sim City, they may have a preconceived notion. People who watched it are laughing <laughs> um, because there was a very specific message being delivered there. Um, what I find is really compelling to just make this super simple is this is a carbon-free source of energy. And I think we have to sort of begin there because I think, and, and Rachel, I see you shaking your head, I think young people do care deeply about the climate change. Uh, issue and and you know so that speaks both to the existing fleet and why we need to maintain it and then we need to to build on on top of that uh, to Dan's point you know um, we all have children probably of varying ages you know my children get their news in a radically different way than I do even today and than I ever did um, and I think that engaging in a stakeholder conversation and taking advantage of social media uh, will be hugely hugely uh, important uh, to bringing those people and, and younger people into uh, this and keeping them in uh, the debate. Again, I think it, it, it's it's not impossible because they care so deeply about climate change. Yeah, yeah great, great conversation. Yeah, and I think if go, I could just ahead, add yeah, quickly, um, I think we should hit the fuel and the used fuel issue um, head on because there's a, 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 a wonderful sort of synergy here between some of these advanced reactors um, and the current fleet, right? So some of these advanced reactors can actually benefit from the used fuel of today. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a wonderful holistic sort of recycling type message that can be interwoven and I think we should hit that head on um, again not talk about reactor specific type paint that broader picture and say there can be a variety of these advanced reactors but talk about the fact that in some cases using some of the fuel that's used fuel today as an energy source for tomorrow that's a wonderful message that, that's a great point I, I think let that, that that we're not gonna have time to explore this as a panel <laughs> Dan and Maria's point, but um, it's a good one for a future panel because I think we're talking a lot about the future, but we need to think about how it fits into the present, but also how do you deal, how do you deal with, make sure that we have that safe, secure, use fuel disposition conversation. And it can be a positive conversation, I, th I think. 
Um, and, and Mark, I'd just like to emphasize that point because there are truly innovative ways of addressing this right. that are just becoming known now. And I would hope we can move quickly to a demonstration of some of these technologies and these approaches. That's what I think it's going to take is real demonstration that these things right. work. Right, good, thanks. So, Mr. Undersecretary, so you're batting cleanup. Uh, so, so we're still on the innovation theme, but you ha you, you'll, you're thoughtful on a lot of the things that we've talked about. So I, I, I give you the floor to give us your perspective. So I'm struck by uh, comments from a variety of the, those that have uh, spoken already that uh, what we really talked about, I think, is uh, a portfolio. Uh, it's a portfolio of ways that we can convert the nuclear resource into to energy services, electricity being, of course, a, a, a very important one, but not the only one. Uh, it's a portfolio of uh, timescales for applications. Um, it's a portfolio that, uh, that uh, uh, depends in some way on using all the advances in material science and advanced manufacturing uh, uh, that can help us uh, achieve the cost reductions we need. I think the, the dividing the world into to sort of three stages is, is uh, a useful way to think about it. But I'll say at the outset and then say again at the end that, uh, that those stages are not distinct in time. They overlap. Uh, so we're in a period now where we're thinking about life extension for uh, the existing reactors. Uh, obviously, we want to do that in a way that maintains uh, <laughs> safety at the highest level that we've uh, uh, done in the past. Um, and that involves, uh, again, the fundamentals of the materials and the fuels and, uh, and possibly designs for new and safer fuels. Um, there are a whole variety of issues that need to be addressed there, uh, but where we have uh, support available from our department uh, and lots of good work uh, going on. Uh, in the medium term, of course, we have five new reactors uh, under construction now. Uh, those will continue, those will build the, the experience and be the examples that set the stage for uh, continued deployment uh, uh, in the near term. Um, in the medium term, uh, the, the, uh, uh, for example, the small modular reactors that uh, there's at least one that will uh, likely uh, enter design certification uh, uh, later this year. Um, we've put a fair amount of support into uh, trying to make that process uh, go forward. Um, that, uh, that will continue. And then there's all the research that uh, in, the, in the next uh, generations, uh, not uh, of, uh, of reactors that involve, uh, uh, they could be um, uh, high temperature gas uh, cool reactors or the molten salt reactors or uh, any of a number of other uh, designs. And then I would say it's, it's important to have a portfolio of sizes. Uh, in a world where uh, you have to build a, a gigawatt reactor, uh, that's a big uh, bite at the apple for lots of organizations. So having a, uh, a portfolio of sizes that can be deployed uh, in uh, a wider variety of settings and uh, with uh, uh, potentially less uh, total capital uh, is an important part of that. Now, uh, if I, we may come back to the to the waste question uh, uh, later on, um, I know. Probably m most of you know that we just, uh, uh, in the last week or so, kicked off uh, a consent-based siting uh, process for, for uh, looking for a way to uh, uh, move that uh, conversation forward in a positive way. Uh, uh, it's been kind of stuck for a while. Um, so there's, uh, there's effort underway there. So uh, at the Department of Energy, at least, we're committed to participating in, uh, uh, in every aspect of this uh, portfolio that uh, uh, we want to do our part to contribute uh, because we think that uh, um, it's absolutely essential that we have the uh, low carbon uh, baseload uh, uh, possibilities as, uh, as part of the broader uh, energy mix portfolio that will get us to the goals of, uh, of uh, uh, much lower greenhouse gas emissions that we need to meet. Thanks. So, so um, we're running we're running a little low on short on time here. So, I didn't I wanted to explore the global picture in more time than I have. I need more time for that. That's a very complex thing. But I do want to get it out there because I think it's important context 
for the next two panels. So, so, so Ashley, I mean, you, you've thought you've you're watching the rest of the world in in a, just succinctly as you can, which is I know hard because it's a very complex complex world. How do you see the rest of the world in advanced in nuclear in, in general in advanced reactors? Well, succinctly, the race is on. Um, there's a lot going on globally in advanced nuclear, and the U.S. is is really in a race here to try to keep up and maintain and and build a lead and really push our technology out there and make sure that our companies are successful. Um, Canada is thinking a lot about their specific needs. They're looking at process heat applications, remote locations, small reactors, uh, even district heating as possible um, applications for nuclear technology. The UK has really started to focus in on nuclear as a good um, source of energy that gives them energy security and a low carbon um, power. And they are moving forward with several government support programs. And um, there are a number of startup companies in the UK and in Canada. There are a number of startup companies who have sort of dual citizenship um, with the US and Canada. And they're, they're looking at both markets. And then, of course, um, there's Russia, where they have uh, just started up the lead fast reactor. And China um, is really leading, I think, a lot of the demonstration work. They have a prototype high temperature gas reactor um, they are building commercial demonstrations of the high temperature gas reactors, and they have strong programs in molten salt and salt cooled reactors. So, so I would say succinctly the race is on, and we really want to be a part of it. Yeah, and it's an opportunity. I mean, Maria, co comment on the opportunity that we have to perhaps maintain U.S. leadership and even perhaps reestablish things in the U.S. Yeah, I think that's key. If you look at, um, as we talked the history lesson, you know, earlier today, the role that the United States has played um, along the way, and it's not just on the hardware. Uh, the United States, uh, you know, the the drive that we've had to improve the capacity factor, and I mentioned earlier, it's been sustained now for over 20 years. That's driven on operational excellence, and we took low capacity factors from, you know, the the 80s time frame and turned it into the numbers we're talking today, the 91.9s. Um, and that didn't just happen, you know, uh, it happened with a lot of hard work and a lot of focus. And so the U.S. is looked as the leader for operating uh, safely and efficiently and effectively. Um, and we need to translate that in uh, to the next generation um, for, uh, for reactors. And uh, if you think about the, the time frames we're talking about, 2030 might sound far away to some. There's a lot of work that has to happen to get us to 2030. You, you, you heard her mention, you know, we're talking test reactors. We're talking making sure that we can get through uh, licensing hurdles. Uh, there's a lot of work and many year time, time frame associated with those. So we really need to band together. Each person has an individual mission, but the power of togetherness in terms of getting the structure and the framework in place is paramount. And that's really what Steve challenged us for earlier in his comments. How do we pull together to speak of one voice to get the, the regulatory way paved? Um, and, and I think that's going to be key to our success. So we didn't even rehearse that, and you, you wrapped it up perfectly. That's, that's awesome. So, so it, was a, it was a great, great discussion. I really appreciate all of you all being up here with me today, and I, I think it was a great way to start. I think the next two panels are teed up very nicely based on this conversation, so thank you again. Thank you.